even uh, uh, post uh, the performance uh, appraisal that has been done, we agreed that we should have even post appraisal discussions and interview with the employee because we agreed uh, performance appraisal is for the development of the employee. We want to actually uh, review and uh, look at maybe the potential of the employee and we see how we can work together as employee and also the supervisor and also being supported by the organization on how we can close any gaps or deficiencies in the performance for better performance. So essentially we say performance appraisal, the main purpose is actually to improve the, 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 the performance of the employee and ultimately of that organization. From that, uh, we also looked at who does the performance appraisal and ideally who should be doing in a, an ideal situation. Of course, we agreed that the line manager for various reasons, the, the, the supervisor is the best place and mostly that is the person who does the performance appraisals for the employees because they are the, 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 the people who allocate them jobs in terms of the job, um, the job description, they are the people who gives them targets, they agree on them, they supervise them and they monitor them and they work with them on a daily basis. So we said they are the better or the best place to do the performance appraisal and they are the commonly used appraisers in most of the organization. Then we had a, a disclaimer and said, however, situations may change and there may be some differences or biases between the employee and their supervisor. And we said, then we can cooperate other appraisers or maybe other raters to come and do the performance appraisal for the employee. You remember we talked about the customers that they serve for those people who are facing the clients. Uh, we are talked about the suppliers. I'm looking at the cases like procurement where there are complaints in the, uh, the, 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 the procurement or the supply chain processes. So we may go back to the suppliers, even in HR, the consultancies you work with. Then we may also look at the peers that you work with if it's a line manager, what do other senior managers in their level think about the, the employee? And also, we also looked at the subordinates, the person that he supervises, he offers uh, leadership could also be uh, used to do the performance appraisal in terms of the 360 degree or what we are calling the motivator kind of a system. We also talked about uh, um, who else? Uh, we talked about the customers, the suppliers, the subordinates, the peers, and also the supervisor. Generally, those are the other people that could contribute to someone's performance appraisal. And why we do this, we want to help the employee perform better. We want to enable the employee know their potential and probably show them what are the areas to improve. And once we get these deficiencies or what we call the performance gaps, uh, we normally do intervention. It could be in terms of coaching, it could be mentoring the employee. It could be training and capacity building. It could be being attached to someone. And uh, all those interventions, you look for the best, you tailor and you agree with the employee on how to improve their performance so that they are able to pull up in their performances. Uh, with that said, we also went ahead and looked at um, the various methods of performance appraisal. And probably you can just... Um, Remind me, maybe the, we, we looked at, um, if I remember very well, we were able to look at four of them. Let me just, uh, here you could just unmute and mention uh, maybe the ones that we looked in details and maybe the others that we mentioned, then we can pick from there in terms of what we did yesterday. I'm hoping all of us, we were there, but is, that is generally what we covered. Let me hear the various methods of performance appraisal that we learned about yesterday, whether in terms of listing them, all explaining them to details. This is where we reached and I think we went halfway. We dealt with four and then we'll continue with the rest of the five this morning. Let me hear, Hortense, which one was very key to you that you remember? I remember management by objectives mm -hmm. and 360 degree. 360 degree, that is where yeah. we were to start today. That is mm -hmm. brilliant. Uh, what else, Jane, Mikwa? Any that you remember apart from the uh, management by objectives, 360 degree? I, I remember the critical incidents one where you keep a record of critical incidences where whether it's good or the bad, the negative Great. or the positive. Mm -hmm. So you're able and to take that and use that data. Yes. 
And we said at times yes. one of the, 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 the low points of it is that employee might feel yes. like the supervisor is keeping a book on them because any time that you do something, then it is put in a book or in a critical incident so that the supervisor can remember or can put a stock, uh, keep a stock that when you come to the appraisal, those are some of the determinants that will actually influence the appraisal. Jen Kingara, any that you remember? One more that we looked at? I don't know whether she's able to unmute. Probably not, um, but that's okay. Um, I'll also be looking at your chats. If you're not able to unmute, you could just uh, talk. I can see quite a number of us have joined us. Welcome. Um, so the others that we looked at is the graphical rating scale, where we said uh, uh, the supervisor looks at uh, various traits, parameters of a person, and they, uh, they, they in a scale of probably one to 10, they draw a chart of where someone falls in. So those are some of the ones that we looked. So we looked at critical incidences. We looked at the graphical rating that comes in forms of the graphs. And we are looking at the traits and we looked at their advantages and their disadvantages. We went ahead and talked about the behaviorally anchored rating skills, what we were calling the bus, which we looked at um, exhaustively. And uh, we also say how, we, we also saw how it is applicable Joroge, kindly mute. There is some noise coming from your end. Kindly mute, you were able to do that. If not, that's okay. I've uh, muted them. You can always unmute yourself. Um, and then we also looked at management by objective as one, the fourth method of performance appraisal. So this morning, we will pick up from there and we're going to look at the multi rater assessment of 360 degree feedback and probably uh, what is it that you can remember when we we, we 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 explained in a summary the 360 degree rating? I've also mentioned it this morning. Let me hear what you remember, what we said about the 360 degree as I share my screen. What is that that you remember about the 360 or what you're calling the maturator? For the 360 degree, what you remember is that you are you are being rated by by everyone, mm -hmm. your immediate supervisor, peers, rating committees, mm -hmm. even that yourself, mm -hmm. subordinate. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is exactly what 360 degrees. And thank you for reminding me. Among the other part, the people who can come uh, to rate an employee is what he has mentioned as um, the rating committee. So you'll find like in our organization, it might go with name, uh, many names. It could be performance moderation committee. It could come in form of the performance uh, harmonization committee, or it could be performance rating committee. So the TOR of this committee uh, generally is not to do the everyday rating of the employee uh, so that uh, in a way that it do, do away with the supervisor or the HR role. We understand the head of, uh, or, or maybe the supervisor of an employee has to do the initial stage of the performance appraisal. Then it is passed through the HR just for quality check. And then thereafter, maybe the HR department is the one that passes the performance appraisals, maybe of all the employee uh, to the rating committee or the to moderation committee or the harmonization committee so that they are able to look at the uh, the corporate performance, how the organization is performing at a global level, how the departments are performing, and then they are also able to actually review the performance appraisal if need be of the employees. Because uh, we all agree you can, find, um, you can find a scenario where the organization is not performing. So when you look at the operational plan for that year, the, 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 the organization could be performing at 50%. And uh, of course, that committee will look at what are some of the factors that contributed to the poor performance of the organization. And they will narrow down to maybe the department. Is it the production? Is it the sales? Is it the commercial department? Is it the finance? Is it the HR? They look at in that consolidated operational plan, which areas were the areas of the weakness in that performance year? 
and maybe which department performed very well. They will also evaluate that and try to align it with the employee's performance because you can find in those departments that staff are, are, are performing at 90% or majority of the staff or three quarter of them or I've even seen cases where 90% or 80% of the staff are scoring the highest marks of the, 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 the five with an average of about 80, 90. But when you look at the corporate performance, it is actually at the range of 40, 50%. So that is the purpose of that moderation harmonization committee. Of course, if there are also uh, performance disputes between an employee and an, a supervisor, of course, we go through the the, the, the grievance handling uh, mechanism we have in the organization. We could uh, maybe take it to the HR, maybe a conversation and discuss, uh, any discussion could solve that. Then the in charge of HR will be able to resolve most of those grievances. But where the grievances persist beyond the HR, now uh, that is where the rating committee comes. They can come and intervene. And also in maybe commercial institutions, and uh, maybe institutions that and corporate organizations that uh, have incentives that are attached to, to the performance, maybe the performance moderation committee, harmonization committee, or the rating committee also comes into play because probably they are the ones who do the allocation of the bonuses and such incentives according to the performance. So it is uh, very clear that the rating committee could only come at that point when we have exceptional cases, but not to look at all the employees and their performance. So that's very good. And basically also what I liked about what he said, it's that in 360 degree, we normally use questionnaires. So we will come with um, a, a, a full questionnaire that is getting employees' performance and subject it to the peers, the subordinates, or you could have different questionnaires depending whether the people are the peer, they are, they are the customers, they are the suppliers, we are taking it to the rating committee, or we are taking it to maybe those other parties. So that questionnaire is uh, prepared by HR, then it's a it's subjected to those parties and also the employee himself also rates themselves. And the main purpose for this is we want to actually show the employee by the end of the day, if there are any disputes, the difference between how they perceive themselves in terms of the performance or even the issues of competencies and how they are seen by external parties, probably their peers, how they are seen by their supervisors, how they are seen by the clients and the customers and how they are seen by maybe that in co co committee. So at times when you look at uh, what we call the Johari window for those who have had, uh, read about it, I'm sure a majority of us have heard, there are those things that we know about ourselves and they are true that we know these are our strengths and our weaknesses. But behind, you can see our back. There are those things that we are not aware and we don't know about ourselves, but the people we interact with on an everyday actually know about those things that we don't know about ourselves. So that's what 360 degree tries to actually bring out in an employee. And then uh, after that, the HR will sit with the employee and walk them through those variances and the similarity that these are the common areas of agreement that everybody knows. We know that you're very good at that. However, people have concern on that. And then we come and see what are those deficiencies that, we, that, that are coming those areas of weaknesses, and then you come together and jointly develop a development plan. And it could be issues like soft working with employee, coaching, mentorship, personal development, where now you encourage the employee to do personal initiatives about what they are doing. So that is basically what 360 degree is all about. But let's what we, we see uh, what we had uh, prepared um, in our slides. Any question about yesterday's recap? Any question, anything that you may, before we proceed? I've looked at the, the, the chats, there are no comment. Any, anything you want me to clarify or we are good to proceed? Silence means we can go on. Uh, that was just a, a, a recap as we were waiting for people to join and I can see now we are a good quorum so we can proceed with where we stopped. Uh, I have just basically explained my understanding about 360 degree. And we are saying the 360 degree feedback is also called the multi-rater assessment because it's done by various uh, raters. 
And we say this method employs a multi-source feedback method, which provides a comprehensive perspective of employee performance by utilizing feedback from the full cycle of people with whom the employee interacts. That is the supervisors. We are talking about the subordinates, the co and the co-workers. And we say that the managers, the peers, the customers, the suppliers, who are the various people who are, who are used to do this rating, and also the other general colleagues, are asked to complete a questionnaire on the employees uh, being uh, on the employee who is being assessed. So the person or the employee being assessed is also required to complete uh, the questionnaire. A questionnaire it could be specific, which is different from what the others, but basically uh, it's trying to measure or gauge the same, same things. Then the HR department provides the results to the employee and the results help the employee to understand how his opinion differs from the group, uh, from the other group that are doing the assessment. Uh, some of the advantages that we have for this multi-rater assessment of the 360 degree feedback is that it is effective for career coaching. When you want to take the method of the career coaching and also the mentorship, the mentorship then you can be able to use the 360 degree because uh, mostly a coach could be someone who is different from even the supervisor. So they'll be able to see the gaps and the areas to be addressed so that they're responsive to the kind of the coaching program they are going to expose the employee to. It also helps to identify the employee strength. We just don't look for employees' weakness. So we are looking at their both strengths and also the weaknesses. And um, maybe the other tool that we could also use for this method could also be what we call the assessment centers. This is uh, something similar to what is uh, majority of us known as psychometric tests. Of course, there are those tests that could be uh, specifically made for employees and also people in leadership position, because what actually those assessments tests uh, bring out is the employee strengths and also their weaknesses. And also some go ahead and give uh, proposals on how we can uh, you can work on that. They also give the issues of personality because an employee's performance, as you'll see, it is determined by very many um, factors. It could be uh, the issues of their training. So we don't assume that all the gaps that that employee has could be resolved through training. It could be personality traits. The inherent traits that someone has makes them behave in a particular way. So when you subject people to this assessment or psychometric test, we are able to see their personality type. And you'll find in any department or any organization or any group or team of people you work with, people have different personality. And this personality and the traits which are so inherent contribute to how someone responds or react or how they relate with their other employee. And those are the things that we, of course, we said they are inherent but they can always be developed or be improved by various interventions such as what we have said as coaching and also maybe we also encourage employees to take personal development initiative because they already know this is how they behave under those circumstances. Then some of the disadvantages to this is um, that the questionnaires um, that the questionnaires we use generally are very lengthy questionnaires so that we are able to gauge all the parameters because we are asking various questions. Some could be job related, others could be just um, competency based. So these questionnaires tend to be lengthy. Uh, I'm sure we all uh, reckon this, we resonate with this, especially when we are doing employment satisfaction survey. At times the questionnaires and the instrument we use are so lengthy that employees take a lot of time to to actually feel and they say the paperwork is too much, we need to that. And then the people that you are following probably are not people who are within your control. If you're talking about the clients and also uh, maybe the suppliers. So they are busy people and it may take time than anticipated. So it's a lengthy process and their questionnaires are lengthy. Then because of these questionnaires, of course, questionnaires are, uh, I, I, I understand with the age of technological advancement, we could be able to do this online. But of course, people will always have uh, an apprehension of technology thinking, could this questionnaire be seen 
could it be intervened by people in the IT or any other person? But also uh, when we go traditionally to the paperwork, you find that the amount of work that is involved, especially the paperwork, it is so extensively large. And that because we involve multiple people who are feeling returning the form and also the, the, the analysis of that paperwork could also take a lot of time. So that is all about uh, the 360 degree. It is as simple as that, but it can be a very effective, especially when we feel probably we need to change the culture. Maybe there are a lot of complaints about a particular person. There are issues of the work environment that we need to, to look at because at times even the performance of the employee is determined by their bosses. How is their relationship with their bosses? Because we should not always blame the employee to be the one on the weaker side. What if the problem could be, maybe if we had more time, we could have looked at some of the case studies. What if the employee, super employee supervisor is the one who has an issue? So we look at that. I also mentioned um, that uh, another method of performance appraisal, and I've seen this being used in um, community-based kind of environment and also the NGO is what we call the AC appraisal. And as the name suggests, it is just a written narrative statement about an employee that just seek to actually evaluate the employee's strengths, their weaknesses, and also the past performance in terms of just a narration, just the right the way we write our essays, open uh, the, 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 the composition that you are, an employee is given a clean slate and they are told, can you comment about the strengths of this particular employee? What would you say are their weaknesses? What can he say, and how would you gauge his productivity and also maybe his teamwork? It is just a written narrative form that is open, that is subjected to the rater, and uh, they do that. However, uh, maybe some of the typical as, uh, 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 questions that we could put in that essay or that, that are normally put in that appraisal essay could be a questions like, describe in your own words. You can say it's say in your own words as the rater, as the supervisor, this employee's performance. It is just the way we do like the interviews where we have open questions. Then we listen to the candidate responding. Then we pick the notes. So a question like describe in your own words, this employee's performance, including quantity and quality of work, job knowledge, and the ability to get along with other employees. Of course, this is narrative. It is speaking on top of your mind because uh, maybe the person doing this appraisal doesn't have the data or the actual statistics about this employee. It's just in your own words. So it could be opinion based. Then another question could be, what are the employee's strengths and weaknesses? It is just like asking, what do people say about him? What is your observation? So majority of this, we are just uh, relying on observations and opinions about how an employee operates. Of course, it has its advantages and it has its disadvantages. One of the advantages of this method is it is a great method for providing specific feedback if evaluator is a good writer. So again, what you see, this is based on someone's competency or the writing skills, the person who is doing the appraisal. Uh, you see, even in our organization and in our leadership, there are people who are very mean with words or maybe their writing skills uh, are limited by some factors. And when you tell them to write even a board paper, they write in sentences of one, two, three words, very short. So they are not able to give a clear narrative. You can compare now this person being appraised or rated by another person who is very efficient and affluent writer who can write pages and pages of essay. Taking us, uh, us back to our primary and high school where we used to do primary, I think that's where we used to do the compositions and the insha. Of course, there are those people who could write inshas of half a page. Others could even do three pages. So it depends with the, our proficiency in writing and also our skills and maybe whether we are storytellers or we just write short sentences. Again, the other issues that we write, it could mean one thing, uh, it could mean one thing from one person and maybe could be interpreted differently by the person who is also doing the appraisal. And some of the advantages is like the length and the content of the essay may vary considerably depending who is doing the rating. 
and SE appraisals are also difficult to compare because you're not comparing an apple for an apple. We are just comparing an open narrative and SE. So you have to look at one and you can't even compare with maybe the different uh, appraisers or maybe the, the different people who are being appraised by them, this kind of a system. Then we say SE appraisals are difficult to compare. That's what I've said. Then the appraisals may be affected by writing skills of the appraiser or the rater. So SE, it is as simple as that. And I know very few, but I was surprised uh, when we were discussing, we found some institutions who are actually relying on that SE. You remember the case I told you that uh, one of the panelists, one of the delegates said in their appraisal, we just give forms with questions and people, the, 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 the supervisors actually rate the people, write the, the narrative, but they have no scores. Like you have scored this, no weighting, no uh, qualitative score. So what would happen to such kind of rating? Then they are left at the masses of the HR or the decision maker. Because when I follow to ask, then what do you do with this appraisal? Are they used for decision making or they, 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 they're just filed? You find majority of these essays are just filed in the employee's file for maybe future reference. Probably if a position comes up and then you go look at the employee's file, then you can read the narrative of that employee and what has happened. And probably the person who is making the decision will give a weighting on their own opinion. It is basically um, maybe by just uh, observation and that could be biased. So let's look at the other method, uh, which we said it is the checklist method. And when you talk about checklist, it is also similar to the essay, but then what happens to this, you ask a series of questions. And I gave an example of, uh, if you have gone for a medical review, either you want to travel or you're coming up with an insurance or it's before you take a surgery. Most of the questions that are asked, are, they're about behavior and experiences, but it is a closed end question where the employee or the person who is being rated, the, the, the rater who is rating the employee, they're only required to answer either in yes or no. So it's either yes, no, or not applicable. It is a closed end questions. So the, 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 the appraiser normally fill those questions in terms of yes or no. And a checklist can also assign varying weights to each question. However, the scoring key or the ratings are not known to the rater. They are normally kept by the HR department who will pick all the checklist and the appraisal forms and they assign the weighting. So you can imagine if you're the supervisor who is using this kind of a method, you are rating a yes or a no, but you are not aware of what that yes or no means. It is like the way we do the psychometric test. We answer all the questions by picking the choices of what we have been given, then the system will go and analyze and give the weighting and what it interprets about that. Of course, this is where we say there's no correct or right answer. But now behind the scenes, the HR has kept a waiting matrix that they don't reveal to the, to the, to the rater. So the rater most of the time is not aware about what they are being rated on. Then uh, some of the advantages of this, it is very easy to use. Anybody can just tick, especially when you see a form that is only requiring you to tick in, in a box, in a checklist, to either say yes or no, not applicable. It is very easy to use. And it is less time consuming if you have to compare with the other uh, methods that, that we are talking about, like behaviorally anchored rating skills, and also the questionnaires. When you talk about the maturating, this is a very easy type of an appraisal. Of course, this is uh, normally used where the systems or the organizations are not so developed, or maybe in uh, small organizations like SMEs that have not uh, have uh, had the full. Um, full-fledged HR departments or structures. And some of their disadvantages, of course, there are three major ones. One is a chance of a biased appraisal as the rater can see positive or negative connotation to any question. So any questions, they might, depending with how they interpret it, they might perceive it to be positive or maybe negative. And that influences how they do the rating. The other one, the, uh, the other disadvantage that it's required to develop separate listing of question of each job category. So for each job category, the checklist has to be the same. 
because you are looking at the job and what kind of questions you may ask in that job. So they differ and you may have different uh, forms or separate listing of questions per the category. Probably you see people in the leadership, again, you may have a different set of questions to actually get that competence in terms of the leadership when they have a team that they are supervising. Then the other disadvantage is that the checklist questions may have different meaning to different raters. So it is prone to bias. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, silent means we can proceed. So after this checklist, uh, now we can look, uh, we have two more. We have the what we call the first choice rating, and then we have the ranking method, which we say it has three prongs of the, the ranking, the three different uh, ranking. So when you look at the first choice rating, um, uh, the, 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 the first cho choice rating, we say that um, it requires that a rater has to rank a set of statements. So they are given uh, quite a number or a series of statements, and then they are required to, 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 to rank them differently. So these statements that they are normally given, they normally describe um, uh, how an employee carries out their duties and their responsibility. And these statements are normally weighted, and the rater usually, again, does not know their weight. But you can see the difference uh, between the first choice rating, which is very related to what we are calling the, the checklist. When you look at the che checklist, what an, uh, the appraiser is required to do is just to ask, uh, it's just to respond in yes, no, or not applicable. But when you come to the first choice, you are given a choice and you have to pick one among the statements that properly or best fit that employee. So it's not a no, it's a description that has already been predetermined. But the same similarity here, the statements are normally weighted and uh, by the HL department and the rater usually does not know the weights. So after all the first choice statements are ranked by the rater, the employee, uh, the HR department applies the weight and compute a scores without involving the, the rater. One advantage of this, it is relatively low cost method because you just need to tick which statement among maybe the four or five best fits. And then it is very easy to use. Then some of the advantages is difficult to explain the results of first choice appraisal to an employee because there was no discussions. It is just how the supervisor or the rater perceives the employee. And you can see they are not basing on any record. They are just basing on what has been forced as the statement be before them. So it is very difficult to explain the outcome to an employee, actually in case they over query or a grievance. Then, because it is relative, it's neither here nor there. And those statements, actually, as you can see, they are all qualitative statements with no qualitative measures. Then it irritates the raters as they feel that they are not being trusted in the way it's associated with the question because it is HR department that does that. So now we can go to the final method. I, 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 this method should not worry you, but that is just what is happening in the marketplace uh, that people are do, using different appraisal methods and probably where we are we use the management by objective we have a specific performance tool or we have the balance scorecard. It is just to understand how, how this developed and came and maybe some could be maybe a combination or one and two and the, maybe the principles have been picked from this method that are applied in the performance rate, ratings or the performance appraisal we use in our workplaces. So don't get lost in the words. It's just for your general understanding. When you meet such a person coming from a community-based organization, an SME, you might find yourself there and you wonder what kind of performance appraisal system and maybe the only one that you have been exposed to are the, the bars and the balance scorecard or those that are apply the management by objectives. So finally, we are going to look at the ranking method. It's also a funny kind of a method, but it is also used. And the ranking method, we talked about three types of ranking. The, the first one was what we call the alternation ranking, where you alternate people. Then there's also the paired comparison where you have to compare one employee with another, just a pair. And then you keep on eliminating, you compare number one with number two, 
then you remove number two, you compare number one to number three, you remove number three, you compare to four, and then we see eventually how does that person rank to the other. So that is how they paired. So you pair people in twos, but different people, and you see which narrative best actually describe that employee, and then you come to rank them. Of course, when you see the word ranking, there must be a winner and there must be a loser. There must be a number one, two, three. They have to be ranked in that order, as you can see in that photo. Then we also have what you call the force distribution. Of course, when you hear force distribution, it uh, is related to what we know as the bell curve, where you have to force a particular group of employee to take a bell-shaped kind of a curve. That you may be having people who are performer, you can say we can only have 10 people who are star performer scoring a five, then majority or three quarter of the employee must be somewhere in the middle between the score of maybe uh, the score of two to four or maybe three and four, or you can decide one and two, we can only have 20%. Then the rest of the employees, about 60%, will fall between three and four because that's the average. Then the outliers, like the five, we can only have another portion of 20%. That is what we call the force distribution. And we'll see some of the challenges of the force distribution. What if we have only a few employees? How, how, how do you force that? What if every employee is a worker and they are performers? Do we have... Are we saying that we cannot have a position that employees, all of them, can work jointly, pool, contribute, and get, get the, the equal scores, and everybody becomes a loser? Are we saying that in every team, there must be someone who is performing highly? So those are some of the challenges and the questions we look at when you are addressing this question of the rating methods. So we say in rating, uh, sorry, in ranking method, the performance of employees is ranked it is relative to the performance of the other. So like we are saying, when you come to ranking, you have, your, your performance ma must be appraised relative to the performance of the other. You're not never looked at in isolation. So the three commonly used, I said, is alternation ranking. We have the paired comparison. And finally, we have the forced distribution, as I have mentioned. Looking at the alternation ranking, as the word suggests, the employees are ranked from the best to the worst on a particular trait. Again, here we are looking at the, but the, the employee's trait, not the job. Choosing the highest, then the lowest until they are all ranked. So we could say, if we have a bunch of maybe 10 employees, who do you think is the best employee among the, the employees? Then you say they are the best. Then there must be the one who comes at the last. So let's just look at the step, how the thinking of the rater goes. The first step is that the names of the employees to be rated are list on one side of the page, let's say the left side. Then the next step is that most of the valuable, uh, most valuable employees on the list are chosen by, uh, by the rater. Then he crosses the name of the left side and move them to the other side of the list, maybe the left, and put them on top of the, 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 the side, that's say the right. So the other thing they do, the rater then selects and crosses off the name of the least valuable employee from the left side the original side, which is the left, and put the names on the bottom of the right. So you see, they pick the best, put on the right on top, then pick the worst from that list and put it below. So the first step, you keep on repeating that until you have everybody fitting. So you could go back and say the second best, put. Then the third best, put. You start with the highest, then you go, then you fit them all into a rank. So eventually, if there are 10 employees, you'll have the list that is jumbled up on the right, on the on your left. Then on the right, it's where you you move them and arrange them from the best to the worst. So that is what we call the alternation uh, uh, ranking. You alternate from the best to the worst, second best, second worst, third best, third worst, and you come up with a chart. So this method involves ranking employees by making a chart of all possible pairs of employees for each trade. This is now the paired comparison ranking that I was talking about. So we talk into pairs of employees. So the same scenario, you have 10 employees and uh, you make a chart of all possible pairs of the employees for each trade. So you are taking a trade by a trade and indicating who is better of the employees among the two. And all, on each and every trait, every subordinate to be rated is paired with a compared all to every other subordinate. So when you talk about maybe punctuality, 
who among all these, who among these two, you take two people, who among these two is an early riser? So you pick, then you go to another uh, measure or what you can call another trait. Who among these is patient between now A and C, then you pick. Then you're giving scores. Then the person who scores the highest at the end of the day becomes the best employees. Let's just look at a typical example. And uh, one of it is that supposed a rata is to evaluate seven employees in this case. The names of these employees are listed on one side. Let's start with the left, the way you sit in a desk. So you have a list of all the employee on one side. You list them on the left side. Then the evaluator then compares the first employee with the second employee on a chosen performance criteria that we have determined, such as the quantity of work, who does most of the transactions, who does most of the sales among those two, maybe number one and number two. So if he believes that the first employee has produced more work than the second employee, a check mark is placed beside the first employee's name. Let's say you give them five and the other one, four. Then you move on. Um, when the rater compares the first employee, uh, sorry, now you have compared number one with number two, now you move to number three. So the rater then the, compares the first employee who has now won in the first one to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth, up to the seventh employee on the same performance criteria. Imagine you have multiple criteria. Again, you check a mark and place beside the name of the employee who produced the most work in the paired comparison. So it is one versus the other. This process is repeated until each employee has been compared to every other employee or not the chosen performance criteria. They could be five according to what you have agreed. But we are saying among the two people, one must be. So finally, the employee with most checks marks are considered to be the best performer. And the employee with the fewest is the lowest performer in that range. That's what we call the paired ranking. Of course, it has its benefits and it has its own uh, disadvantage. First uh, method of ranking is what I say, the first distribution. And as per the name suggests, and I had done the preliminary explanation, the method requires that the rater compares performance of employees and places a certain percentage of the employee at various performance levels, the high performer, the average performer, and the lower performer. Here, it is assumed that the performance level in a group of employees will be distributed according to the bell shape or what we call the normal performance curve. Of course, we have a lot of complaints from the employee when they say, do we have to have a normal curve in the performance? And that is a question that I'll throw to you. Do we have to have a normal performance curve or what we call a bell curve in every department? Because we hear some employees complaining that their supervisors are forcing a curve on their performance, that because a lot of people have scored this, we must have people who are outliers on the extreme end. And how do we base those outliers? What factors? Is it objective? Is it based on data? Is it based on performance or criteria that have been pre-agreed? Is it based on actual appraisal? Or we are putting some biases on that. So when you look at this force distribution, we say that this ranking method is unique from other methods because here one employee's performance evaluation is a function of performance of other employees on the job. So what determines your performance is your, it's relative to the other person's performance. You are not looked at individually. Then the major drawbacks of this method is that uh, for a small group of employees, a bell-shaped distribution of performance may not be applicable. What if you have to, are you saying two cannot score the same marks or they cannot perform lowly, both of them, or highly, both of them? Also, a normal curve is probably not a perfect curve. Hence, this implies that employees are probably not rated accurately because we are not basing this appraisal on maybe uh, job-related parameters and the other factors that are coming in. So maybe some of the examples of this first uh, distribution that we have seen in the workplaces, it is where a supervisor or an organization determine that 10% of their employers will be rated as high performance. You live in here, 
a communication from the CEO or the head of the department that from the performance or even from HR, that the high performance of your department, it cannot carry more than 10% of your people. Then they may give a rating of 25% must be high average performance on the high, on the second high percentile. Then we have 40% average performance in that category. Then in terms of the low average performance, which I call a two, should be not more or not less than 10%. Then we expect to see a 15% of low performance. Those are the people. So you can see the low performance, the ones and the two, you have a whole 25% of that people. Of course, we have even had these incidences, even in learning institutions and academics, where an institution decide, maybe some of what we know of, that 25% of the employees must fail their exams. How many of these have, how many of you have uh, experienced this in your workplaces? or maybe even your learning institutions or any other organization that has to do the rating. Anyone, let me hear from your experiences as we come to the end of the, 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 the methods of performance appraisal. And now we move to something else. Let me hear your appraisal, uh, your, 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 your comments either from the chat. I'm sure now we are a big number. You can unmute so that I hear your voice this morning. Let me hear, share your experiences about the first um, distribution rating. Is it a new concept? Is it? Ada, tell us something. Kate, Daniel, Faith, Irene. Mm -hmm. Anyone who has experienced the force distribution? Could be in the current workplaces, could be in the previous workplaces from your learning institutions. See a comment on the chat. For Lillian, this is totally new to her. She has never heard about the first distribution. Or does it happen behind the scenes, maybe in the HR department, in the senior management, where those parameters are given? And you, you wonder well, how comes 25% of, uh, of the candidates or the students have failed the exams or the performance appraisal because we cannot afford to give increments in the salary incentives and bonuses. For Lillian, this is a totally new field. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Kate says, this is new to me, but I think it happens with senior management. Mm -hmm. So it does happen. It does happen if you've been around long enough. If you have so sat in that panel, including the rating committee, sometimes this happens. And especially maybe those are some of the parameters that those committees apply when we have uh, those big variances in how employees and supervisors are rating themselves and how the corporate is performing. Those are maybe some of the things. Others said I have experienced it in the learning institution. Sometimes it's called moderation, exactly. That's the beautiful use, what we normally use. So when here we have a performance moderation committee, that is what moderation may entail. But at times, as we say, that, curve, what we call the force distribution of the normal curve may not be a perfect curve. At times we call it harmonization, moderation. Thank you, Ada, for that. And I like, so I can see we are following, we are learning, and uh, we say those are some of them. So you don't be surprised if you are to go to a meeting and you find some people or some quarters in the strategy, uh, they are asking that this be done. It has happened. Because you can imagine if we give everybody a name, what happens? Let's continue. So from there, uh, I think we are, had, we, we are done now with the hard theoretical thing. We go now back to very practical issues. And now we are going to look at the importance of performance interviews. And I want you to unmute your mic and tell me, do we normally conduct performance appraisal interviews 
and at what point do we conduct them? Performance appraisal interviews. Have we heard about performance appraisal interviews or we just heard about recruitment interviews? What are performance appraisal interviews as a way of giving feedback? Mm -hmm. Appraisal interviews, and are they necessary? We want to see why they are critical. Maybe this could be the biggest area of your weakness in terms of uh, the performance appraisal. Appraisal interviews, what comes to mind? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Yes, um, uh, um, from my side, yeah. um, the, the interviews that we do, okay, or rather, a communication yes. between the supervisor mm -hmm. and the, um, the junior yeah, on yeah. A, a various rating. For mm -hmm. example, if mm -hmm. um, I was given a score to, yes. the, the supervisor explains to me why mm -hmm. it was two and not three. And mm -hmm. then we, we agree. Mm -hmm. uh, basically that, and um, when we are starting the, the appraisal period, mm -hmm. after the objectives of the department are set, yes. there is a bit where we sit uh, between the supervisor and the junior, we mm -hmm. agree on uh, the targets. Yes. So I think that is part of the interview. Yes, it is. It is part of the interview. It is part of the interview. It is actually part of the interview. And um, what Stella has said, uh, we can have interviews at different levels. When we are discussing the targets and the goals with the employees, then we have what you call goal setting interviews. Again, when you are doing the monitoring, apart from asking the paperwork, an employee could just walk into the supervisor's office and I ask, is one of the actually the responsibility when you're doing the sensitization of employee that they should be proactive and take the initiative of going to seek feedback from their supervisor or their raters at the end of the day? Just to gauge, yes, we agreed on this rating. How do you think as a supervisor I'm progressing? So you seek that feedback. Those are conversations, they are performance conversations that we normally have in the office. Then comes the appraisal period. What ought to happen? A supervisor, or it could even start from the HR. When HR generates that communication, that we are now in the performance appraisal phase, which is the policy and people ought to know, because it all starts from the department at, a, at an enterprise level. When the HOD now know by the end of this quarter, by end of this half year, we should be doing the departmental appraisal. At that point, the supervisor should take the initiative of notifying their employees that we are for next week, we shall be having performance appraisals for the department and for also for the individual. How this helps, it enables the employees prepare for the performance appraisal. They'll be able to go back and look at their JD and see what it was expected of them by their supervisor. They'll be able to go back and get the individual work plan with the pre-agreed and jointly signed performance targets and KPIs they had, and they'll be able to get the data and the information of how well they have performed. So they'll take the actual performance, they'll be able to review, see and gauge where they are before the interview happens. So that preparation phase, it is very critical so that we don't have a supervisor ambushing an employee because they have come from HR office, they have come from the CEO's office, and when they land back to the department, they start by calling, Sir, come and do your appraisal. Print your appraisal, come. So the employee is found uh, unprepared. They didn't know, they didn't have the data. Probably they were serving the client. So you should be able to maybe come up with a, a schedule for the appraisal interviews and allocate the employees their timelines and they know in advance this type of the day, I'll be meeting my supervisor to discuss about performance appraisal. And they know what scope of appraisal are they talking about? Is it for the quarter? Is it for the half year? Is it for the annual? And they'll be able to gather all that information and they'll be well equipped. What happens when an employee is given enough notice and they prepare 
and the supervisor also have time to prepare for that interview, everybody will have their set of questions that they would want to ask the solution that have not met this target. I'm aware, but these are the uh, initiatives that I have put, and they'll be able to explain that to the, uh, the, to, to the supervisor. They will know I'm not able to get this because probably I'm not understanding this and I'll need support from my supervisor. On the other side of the supervisor, having all the data for the employees before they meet them, they already know it's like going through the CV and the, the, the qualification of an employee before they come in for an interview. You already know who is coming in, how they have performed, their areas of strength and weaknesses. So you'll be able to quickly see which are the areas that I need to put more time and effort that we need to discuss and find solutions with the employees. So that is what performance interviews entail. And most of the organization we miss out on this because we'll just send an email comes, everybody fills their home, it is sent to the supervisor, put on their desk in a clean folder because it's a clean door, a closed door policy. The appraiser will come and appraise the employees and the form put in a confidential taken to HR. So the appraisal uh, bit for the interview misses. And what you ensure when you're coming out with your performance tool, ensure that your tool gives room for these interviews and discussion. Where the employee, I said, they do the self-appraisal. Then during the discussion, as Stella has said, now those discussions happen. I gave myself this call. These are the, 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 the evidence that I have and the documentary proof and support. Then the supervisor has these and you engage and you come to an agreement. And then after you do that, of course, when you're discussing, that form will go back to the employee to make a comment. Yes, I acknowledge that we have discussed my performance with the supervisor. We have agreed on this going forward. And this is what, and I'm happy with our discussion, you sign. After you sign that, goes to the supervisor, probably again, we have agreed as that, then forward to HR. So that has captured. How, what does that does? It also reduces the number of grievances. And actually, the employee is also able to buy in into the performance appraisal. They are able to appreciate the, the supervisor in terms of guiding them and appraising them because you are basing them on pre-agreed criteria and the, the standards. It's already known. It is factual. It's objective. Of course, during the interview, if you see other issues that are cropping up in the employee and you think as a supervisor, they could be limiting his performance, you can raise those issues. Probably they are coming in late. If that is not a part of the criteria for evaluation, you say, you know, you are lagging behind your work schedule, or you submit your assignment late because I have noted of late you've been coming to the work late. On these incidences, I noted this. If you had come early, or if you spare 30 minutes early before the, the, the start of the day, or at the end of the day, before the start of your day, or at the end of the day, probably you'll be able to catch up with the rest of the people. And I'll give example. Stella normally comes in very early or on this day when you have this assignment, they're able to complete. And before you go home, you have completed your assignment and submitted. Or maybe in the mo next morning, you are able to review. So that's the kind of discussions we are talking about. And that is how the important appraisal is. So when that form comes to the HR, of course, you can see that the evidence that discussions actually happened and everybody was contented. In future, that protects the organization in terms of the litigations, and it also protects the employee in terms of few, maybe subjectivity in decision-making that may happen in future. So it is a very critical stage of the performance appraisal that determines the efficiency or effectiveness, actually not efficiency, but the effectiveness of a performance appraisal. Of course, efficiencies comes in terms of saving time because they are not back and forth. And once we have agreed, it is agreed. It even gives very easy work for the HR and also for the rating and the moderation committee that has because the performance appraisal is also uh, objective. And in case of anything, if the appraisee or the appraiser is called in by any other party to just give a brief about the performance of a particular employee, it naturally flows because it is there and they have discussed. It is not just a paper that passed by the desk among so many that uh, they, 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 they didn't even have a grip of that information. It also helps the supervisor have a grip about the employees they are dealing with. 
Um, and the other thing, of course, someone may ask, broader organizations are not the same. Some organizations are very large and huge, and it is not practical for a supervisor to do that kind of an interview. It is possible because it is not the manager or the head of the department who literally do this appraisal. And that is how we split our groups into sections and the units. And we have a span of control or the people. So we, we can delegate this, like we have five people who are reporting, maybe, maybe five HR assistants who are reporting to a HR officer. So the person they report direct to, it's not the head of HR, but the HR officer. Maybe we have a number of HR officers or business uh, HR business partners who are reporting to a particular senior officer. So it is that grading. So every person with the people they have, they can be able to, whether they are there structurally, or there are people who you have assigned that role because they oversee the work of these people. You only guide them in terms of coming up with the targets and how uh, you coach them and mentor them on to do that. They should be able to hold those discussions so that where you sit as a manager or a HOD, you'll be looking at those forms after their discussions and their agreement. And probably you'll only deal with the outlier cases where maybe there are some grievances at the departmental level. So that's how they appraisal interviews work, and that is how important they are. So let's look at what I have, then I can open to maybe any questions that we may have um, of what I've just explained about why they're critical, what it involves, and why we think it's important in this process where we are seeking to get the effect, effectiveness of a, an appraisal system. So appraisal feedback, appraisal or what we call the feedback interviews. Uh, we say appraisal or feedback interviews are essential part of any performance appraisal system. I cannot overemphasize that. Then it is at this stage that the manager and the subordinate reviews the appraisal and makes plan for, uh, to correct any deficiencies to reinforce the strengths that comes in so that the employee is able to capitalize on them and to improve the performance of that employee. And in order to prepare for interview, it is essential that the subordinate is given at least a one week's notice to review his work. This is probably what we miss. Don't ambush an employee. To read over his job description, to analyze the problems that he's experiencing, to compile any questions they may have and they comment because they have already gone through it and have thought about it. So we don't have occasions where the supervisor will be asking, do you have any question? Like it happens when you have not done proper research in an organization and you're going for an interview, when the panelists throw the last question, do you have any question for us? Of course, it's not a must that you ask a question, but we find ourselves blank. So we are saying, depending upon the type of, the, the type of appraisal of the employee, there are three types of appraisal interview scenario that you can face a supervisor or the person who is doing the performance. And the first one, which is very easy, I've put it in green because it's an easy and a conversation that we all look forward to, whether you are being the employee or your supervisor or you are the rater, whether in HR or any other person. It when we are talking about a performance that is satisfactory, an employee is promotable. You look forward to such conversation and they are very easy because there are a lot of good experiences to share. There are a lot of things to brag about and have performed, and there are the good things to report. So you see you are a shining star, and the conversation is likely to be very easy, very pleasant. Then the second level could be performance is satisfactory for that employee, and the employee is not promotable. I could want to hear why you think we could have an employee who is a very satisfactory, who is very satisfactory in terms of performance. But in the views of the management or the supervisor or the HR, this employee is not promotable. It could be because maybe this employee is a good worker, but lacks the qualification of the next job. In terms of maybe when you look at your career progression guideline or your scheme of service, this employee is performing satisfactory, but they have not acquired the required skills they have uh, not acquired the required training, academic qualifications, or professional qualifications. It could also be this, perform, uh, this employee is performing very well, have all that, 
But when you look at the, 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 the career progression guidelines, he has not served in that position long enough. We normally give three years, must have served in the previous position for three years. So the perform uh, performance is pleasant and good, but they are not promotable. Of course, when you see this employee come into this conversation, they feel I'm a good performer. And they, 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 they're coming with the attitude or, or the expectation this, we should not be looking at the qualifications, the academic, whether I've served long enough. What we should be looking at, it is whether I'm performing or not. They live and cite examples of, we have someone who has even served in this position for the last 10 years, but they're not performing. There are people with degrees and masters and PhD that you say I don't have, but they're not performing as good as I'm performing. So you should be able to, to categorize your employees and not the kind of discussions. And probably this person is coming with a high expectation of promotion. Probably the first one who is performing satisfactory and they are promotable, they are coming with very high expectations of a promotion around the corner, but your HR has said we have frozen on any promotions and recruitment, and probably there are no positions for them to be promoted to. Even the second part, it can apply. Let's say it's a head of department, and the next position available is the CEO, and the CEO is the incumbent is there, and he's not about to retire. He's not about to go. So where are they going to be promoted to? So you can look at, is there a way we could restructure their job so that it is more challenging? Can you give them maybe more scope, more supervisory role, more leadership? Maybe put them in the task force so that you can be able to keep them challenged and alive and to also motivate them to continue with their performance and the good performance they are doing. Then the third category, which I've put in gray, is the performance of an employee. It is unsatisfactory, but it is correctable. Of course, they are not promotable because they are not performing. Their performance is satisfactory, but they are correctable. And the questions that you'll be asking yourself, of course, this employee is correctable, but is he willing? Is he ready? What are some of the factors that are contributing to his poor performance? Is training intervention going to work for him? Is coaching going to work for him? Does he need to work on his attitude? Is it his personality traits? Uh, is it because of the peer pressure? Is it that now he has been a good performer, but now he's not performing and he feel disengaged and not motivated? Those are the things that you should go through your mind and also the mind of the employee as you're preparing for this appraisal. Then when you're doing these feedback interviews or performance appraisal interviews, there are some things that we put, we must put in, uh, in mind. And we say the, the few key points that a manager or the appraiser should keep in mind as they are preparing for conducting an appraisal interview are issues like when he's conducting this interview, he should actually be relaxed in the first place. He should not be apprehensive. And when he's discussing with the employees, he need to be direct and specific on the issues he want to discuss, either their strengths or their weakness. They should not be beating about the bush and taking a big car before they come to the point they want. He should be very direct and specific on the issues that he want to discuss with the employee. Then he should also be able to encourage the employee to talk as well. It is not an interview for the appraiser or the manager. It should be a two-way communication. And a good interviewer should give sufficient and adequate opportunity for the employee to express themselves. As the employees are expressing themselves, you pick a lot. You might even pick things that you are not aware that is actually affecting their performance. Then from there, you even try to engage them with all this that you have seen and according to your understanding and these challenges that you have cited, what are some of the proposed solutions? How do you think we can overcome this? How do you think I can support you in this? How do you think the organization can support? So even the answers and the solution, first they should be generated from the employee because we are only facilitating the discussion. Of course, we will make the decision, but we facilitate. Then the manager or the person who is the appraiser should never get personal and to go to personal issues with the employee. He should stick to the objective performance related things that are work related. If there are other extraneous factors that he has experienced 
out of the workplace, he should not bring them to this discussion because now they'll be getting personal. Then whether you are acquaintances or you know uh, other issues that you have interacted maybe with a sister, with the employee, stick to professionalism and the work performance related. You should not be able to bring the outside interactions and the biasness into such discussion because they'll also influence your, your credibility, your objective so that we remain more credible. Then he should develop an action plan from the information gathered that after the interview, it is done. Mostly these interviews, they are held in such a way that we record the discussions the solutions and come up with an action plan and the implementation matter. This is by the end of this discussion, this is what we have talked about. These are the cited challenges. These are the responses and the, the, the solutions proposed to the employees. This is what the employees to do. Then you come up with an action plan so that in your next performance appraisal discussion, then you pick up from there and you are reviewing from the action plan that we developed on how to improve your performance this was followed and we see where we dropped the ball. Then just as a continuation, we are saying there are certain cases where an employee may be highly resentful of their appraisal results. You can see the guy who's here has been appraised. We have had those incidences where an employee has, self, has done the self-appraisal, go to the supervisor, they argue, don't agree with the rating and he end up tearing the appraisal papers and he's in a range. So when we say, and this will amount to an employee being highly defensive. Whether they are going to the next level of the manager, whether they are coming to the HR, whether they are coming to the committee, whether they are going back to the appraiser, probably he's been told, go and change this mask and then we come and discuss. When you are ready to discuss, he's very defensive. And he's a, an employee who is going to approach any interview or feedback uh, session with a lot of defense. So what do you think as a manager, because we are all going to be managers, we are all managers in our own right, when we face with such characters, what should we do? And we are saying some of the things that we should keep in mind when you're handling such employees are such that the manager should recognize that defense behavior, it is normal. Especially in an environment and culture where appraisals become events and locations to put employees down. Where the supervisors say, let's wait and see, we'll make, I'm your boss. Actually, people know that you, you are their boss when it comes to appraisal because you determine the appraisal and the bonus and the incentives, they, they come up. So this person become very uh, resentful. And what we should remember that for someone who has not scored so well, because I don't see that happening to someone who is a star performer, it is very natural and it is very normal for them to be defensive. So you should be able to keep their cool. They should, you should not, both of you, hit the roof. You should be able to maintain your cup as this is all happening. So you should ensure that, and remember, this is normal. You should actually be able to anticipate because you already know your employees. And you should never attack the person's defense. Listen to them. Observe them. Be a very good listener, observe the body language, but never attacks the person's defense. You are not in a competition. It's not about who wins. We are trying to come up with a performance, um, performance solution, and we are looking for improvement of these employees. Then you should understand the need to postpone the action. If you find like the meeting, you're not yielding what you needed to achieve, or the environment has become hostile that you're not able to, or the employee has become so emotional that he's not able to think in a rational way. You're not able to be objective. You can only you can always postpone even that interview. And you say, I give you more time. I can see this is not uh, uh, going well with you or both of us. Probably we could consider shelving this and we can maybe meet tomorrow morning when you're both of us are fresh. And I would want you as you go, reflect on what is happening, what I have said, you go look for more information and we come and have a fruitful discussion and we come with open mind tomorrow. So you can always postpone that. If it's a deadline you have been given by HR as the manager, you can, only, you can always explain this. It's not a matter of life and death. 
and say, I'm not being able to finish with the employees because you don't want to escalate the insubordination. That's not being good, a, a good leader. Ensure that you take it within your strides and probably give an employee a chance. Of course, there are scenarios where certain employees will not wait for that next meeting and they will rush to the CEO, with they rush to the HR and advance now arise. If thou they decide to take that route, then you follow the procedure for grievance handling. And of course, we all understand for grievance handling in any organization, the first line is the line manager, unless the employees are grieved by the line manager. And of course, such other mechanisms have been established in the workplaces. So even as you're doing your HR policies, ensure or your performance management policy, you have incorporated into your policy, the grievance handling for performance management. Then the manager should emphasize and understand the human limitation. Is it his personality? Is he his, his traits? Are there other extraneous factors that are making this employee become defensive? Is it his past experience with his previous bosses? Is his, his relationship with the team or their immediate supervisor, you should be able to understand and try to peel the onion so that you are able to understand that. Any question about the appraisal feedback and the interviews? Before now, we go to the tips and what will be the requirement for you to be able to have an effective appraisal system. Of course, all that we have learned from yesterday, the tips that we keep on throwing, whether it's the agreement, whether it's the discussion, having the right tool, the tool having the proper components, setting the criteria, having these discussions, all that, the method to use, they contribute to an effective performance appraisal. But I'll just do a summary. What are some of the key requirements that you can carry home and ensure that are there? Of course, we'll repeat some of that. Any questions about the interview? Any experiences that you'd want to share? And tell us, maybe this worked for us, this didn't go well, we had these challenges. Let me see, let me hear from you before we proceed to the requirements. I think we are doing okay in terms of time. We'll be able to finish. Any? Let me hear any comment then. Any question from what we covered yesterday, what we've covered this morning, before now we, ne we move to the next item, which is the requirements for an effective appraisal tools. Now we are going narrow down into the, the tips and the recommendations of what we do with all these challenges that we have talked about. Mm -hmm. Is it clear? Are we following? Is the topic clear? Are we following? Yes, we are following. Okay, so we can continue. We proceed, then we can also ask more questions at the tail end. I'm seeing comments on the chat. Yes, clear and following, yes it is, uh, that's okay. So let's proceed with that. So what are some of the requirements that we have prepared for you for us to be able to achieve this elusive, effective performance appraisal system that we are talking about? Let's look at some of the few requirements. And one of them I can say, as I'm struggling to move with the slides, is documentation. Documentation, documentation, documentation is key. The other, that, the other one that comes top of my mind is communication. Communication, communication. Whether we are communicating during the interviews, when you are setting the targets, when, when you are doing the, what you are calling the regular monitoring and not waiting for the last minute, giving feedback, even post appraisal interviews, Communication is very key. Um, I don't know whether it's my system. Okay, good, now we've come. Uh, so the first, we're going to look at the various components that will help you make a, make a very good effective uh, performance appraisal. And the first one is about the role clarification. The law clarity talks about the JD and the individual work plans and the KPIs. When an employee is clear about what is expected of them, then they are more likely to work towards that with a lot of ease. When the employer, when the supervisor, when the appraiser and the rater 
is very clear about what they expect of a particular employees and they set clear targets that are smart, then when it comes to the appraisal, it is likely to work very well. So the employee as well as the organization should be clear about the role and the responsibility of each individual in the organization. And we determine this dual having clear JD. Number two is developmental goal setting. Once we have a clear JD, we have the strategic plan and we know where we are all heading. And I know as an individual employees what are meant to contribute, then it is very easy for us to come and set what we call the developmental goal. Call it the goal setting. We talked about defining goals, determining the performance criteria, and also setting the targets for the employee at the beginning of the period. So that is how what about developmental goal setting. And we say the goal set for each employee should not only look at the present needs of the individual's career and the organizational's goal, they should also be projective. They should be developmental and also futuristic. So such developmental goals that meet, need, meet the, the future needs of the organization will help the organization to grow their career and to simultaneously benefit the company as well. Because we should not be short-sighted. We should be able to look at what, the, what is the requirement. When you look at the strategic planning, it is a long time plan. It covers a period of five years. So maybe the skills and the needs and the training that we require now may, be, may keep on evolving and changing as times goes by. If you are to build the capacity of employees at a time like now, when we are having even staff working from home, when uh, employees are agitating for more uh, work-life balance and the pandemic, the lessons it has touched us, you need to see where is the organization going? How do we need to develop our team? What is the way to go? That you should be able to even come up with the performance uh, measurement uh, uh, system that are able to gauge the employee in terms of the results, the output and the outcome, not the number of hours they are spending in there. So are we able to set clear goals, look at the key result areas, the outcome and the output to be the measures and not just what we observe? What if the employee is working from home and virtually, and we are not able to observe those attributes that we use traditionally to look at. So when you're looking at the development, it's both for the organization and also for the employee. Then ongoing performance monitoring, we've talked about that. And we are saying uh, that uh, each individual performance should be continuously monitored at regular intervals by holding performance appraisals at least once or twice before the annual appraisals. And we say such appraisals help to get a fair idea about the progress that the individual is making. So you're able to get a fair uh, progress report, you as an employee and also the supervisor who is actually going to uh, do that. And when you do this monitoring, ongoing feedback is very important. You have seen the importance of interview. The employee should be able to know how well they are doing. And we say it, feedback is both ways. The employee should proactively seek feedback from the supervisor. And the supervisor should be prompt in giving feedback before it's too late for any observable incidences or occurrences or event or deficiencies and the gap they note in the process of the monitoring. So we say continuous performance, uh, performance monitoring helps the organization to provide ongoing feedback about individual's performance and it helps improve performance and bring it in line with the individual goals. The other issue is the goal alignment. Goal alignment actually ensures that every employee in the organization it is, uh, it is pulling towards the same strategic direction of the organization. That is why when we set goals, Every individual goals and the targets, they are cascaded from the departmental plan, which has been cascaded from the operational plan and which has come from the strategic plan. So there must be an alignment that when an employee come to work every day, they know whatever they are doing, it is pulling towards the achievement of the strategy objective of the organization. So we say the goal set for each employee 
should be in direct alignment to the company's strategic goals and the company's vision, mission, and they are being carried within the values of the organization. Coaching and support is very critical again. And we say any kind of gaps or the deficiencies found in the, job, in the individual jobs related knowledge or performance can be filled by providing coaching and support in the form of training of those individuals. And the other important thing is standardization. That the entire performance management system should be a standard format that we normally use. The main reason for this is that when we have standard format for everybody and people who are doing the same role, having the standard targets and the performance criteria and goals, then we are able to compare an individual's performance against the other. And everybody will feel that they've been treated fairly and also equally. And there are no biases that we give totally different targets, different performance expectations from one employee, and they're doing the same work with them. So it should be a fair process that is equal, and that can only be attained through standardization of the whole processes. So we cannot have maybe some employees or some departments that are being appraised once in a year, other quarterly. So we should have a standard way of doing the performance appraisal. And we say the entire performance management process should be standardized to maintain consistency between the appraisal from one time to the other. And the standardization helps to bring the appraisal carried out across different periods to come at par and to allow comparison between them. So even the, the performance target that we set at the beginning of the year, it is annual targets. When we are we're doing the quarterly and the half year, we are only breaking that annual into small bits. So it is cumulative, but standard. So we are not changing goalposts. And anytime we need to change the performance appraisal and the process, then the employee needs to be notified in advance and notified in writing for any changes that come in the course of the appraisal period. The other issue I talked about, communication, communication, communication. And when you talk about the communication, it's two-way communication and it's what we call continuous open communication. And we say an open communication should be encouraged between the employee and the management with respect to the appraisal process, as well as any other concerns and suggestions that the employee may have. Of course, this applies when we come to the employee and the supervisor, and also applies when you're talking about the management and the employees. Of course, the HR should have a way, whether it's through the employment, uh, the employee satisfaction survey, to get feedback about the, 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 effect, the effectiveness of the performance appraisal system. Again, when you talk about the interviews, post appraisal interviews and conversations should continue. And what we normally get from this, it is the employee's experience of the whole performance appraisal process. So they're able to give the feedback, what are the strengths, what are the way areas that work so well in this performance appraisal process? What are the areas of improvement? Are there areas even in terms of how the forms are structured that they feel and they think should be captured? And then that feedback is given to the person who is dealing with the performance management. It's given to the HR for continuous improvement. We said the essence of performance appraisal, it is for continuous improvement of the individual or the institutions of the structures of performance appraisal and that of the organization and individual. Then the appraisers ought to be trained. I don't know how many of us take time to train our supervisors, our line managers, our raters, and our appraisers. It is something that we always forget. I mentioned this yesterday that regularly, all the employees should be sensitized and trained on performance appraisal, right from the onboarding. When they're coming into an institution, during their induction and appraisal, it is the responsibility of the HR to take them through the performance appraisal tools, to explain to them in this organization they are joining, how performance management operates generally. You explain the whole system and the processes, and you come down to narrow on what it is expected of them in the appraisal with their supervisor. 
It is the HR to introduce the performance appraisal tools to that employee before you even take them to the department. It is the role of the HR during the induction and the training to explain to the employees, the new employee, what is expected of them and their responsibilities in terms of the performance appraisal. You share with them the tool, you show them the format of an individual plan, and you emphasize with them and you tell them by the time we send you to the department, we expect within the first month, the first two weeks, that you have discussed with your line manager and signed your JD, you have come up with your performance plan for the period of the probation or for that year, and you have signed off your performance agreement in terms of the performance targets, so that as you are proceeding with your probation, which we will measure at the end of the three months or six months, you already know what you are supposed to concentrate and put your effort in and what you'll be appraised. It is upon HR, after expiry of such period, you keep on reminding the employee and monitoring to ensure that such documentation has been filled and they have been filed with you. To remind the employee that they should be able to follow up with their appraiser and their supervisor, the signing of the JD, the individual work plan, agreed targets, so that before the probation period and we are doing the probation review, they have already agreed and they know their what and they keep on seeking the feedback so that we don't have surprises at the end of the probation. The same way, that is now for the general employee. Or the line manager, whether they are, line, they are new line manager, they are old line manager, they are experienced line managers. Performance appraisal is one of the difficult assignment they have because they are too busy with their core functions of the organization that HR just appear like a distractor in their busy schedule for performance appraisal because they probably don't know how to conduct performance appraisal. They don't know what to tell the employees when we come to the performance interviews. They don't know that they are prone to some errors in terms of and prejudice and biases when it comes to performance appraisal and you help them to overcome. First, by identifying them, telling them how they, 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 they actually present themselves and what they can do so that they're able to overcome that. So you need to have continuous training of the appraisers and the, anybody who does the performance appraiser organize for a special training for them for those forums like every three years and during those interviews, let it be as interactive as possible. So as again, you can also pick the feedback from them on the challenges they are experiencing. Then you'll be able to address the gaps and the challenges. You'll be able to build their capacity. You'll be able to train them and you'll be able also to review your processes and the forms that you have for continuous improvement. So the other fundamental issue for an effective performance appraisal system is mutual trust and confidence. And I can tell you, performance appraisal in any organizations rise and falls on trust. Trust is a fundamental pillar. In an organization or an environment or a culture where there is no trust between the management and the employee, between the supervisor and the employee, the performance appraisal will be marred with a lot of challenges because there is no trust. I cannot trust the process. I cannot trust the, 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 the appraiser. I cannot even trust the credibility and the objective. So it all rests on trust. And also the confidence that the employees have on the system, they form their leadership. So there should be an air of mutual trust and confidence between the employee and the management which will ensure that both understand each other and is working for the other's benefits and in other's favors. And that is very critical when you do those training as HR, who is the custodian of performance appraisal, you are able to collect the feedback from the employees. When you interact with them, when you train them, when you help them overcome the challenges, and when you do the same to the, to the management and the raters. So you'll be able to see, of course, both of them have different set of challenges, but you are the custodian at the middle. The employees have their own set of challenges. The appraisers have their totally set, different set of challenges. And 
you'll be able to pick all that and improve the processes and build an environment of trust when it comes to performance appraisal. We want to have that environment of trust that we saw at the beginning between Michael and Chris and in the organization in that conversation. The other fundamental issue is post-appraisal interview. I think I've mentioned this passingly, and we are saying there should be a post-appraisal interview con conducted to gather the feedback from the employees about the appraisal process as a whole, as well as to discuss individuals' appraisal-related concerns and queries. I think I've discussed that, I cannot uh, overemphasize. Then the reviews and appeals. One of the key uh, or the common grievance we have is in HR is performance appraisal related grievances, or maybe the employee and, uh, and supervisor relationship. And we are saying in our HR policies, we should be able to come up with very clear performance appraisal policies that should be have a clearly uh, laid down protocol to accommodate any kind of individual appeals to the appraisals conducted and review uh, the rating given. This could be a those moderation committee, the harmonization committee, or the grievance procedures for performance appraisal in the performance policy should be clearly uh, laid out. And of course, when there is a grievance, the escalation matrix should be very clear that if the disagreement is between the supervisor and the, and the employee, probably escalate to the line manager, to the head of the department, to the HR, to the moderation committee. And if beyond that, before it even comes to the attention of the CEO, who probably might recommend for another team, especially if it has now to go through the disciplinary ways, if, they are, if, if actually the two parties could not be, and there may be Conduct, misconduct issues. Then we say objectives need to be smart. We say smart objectives. So each individual performance should be measured against specific laid down objectives, which are clear and not vague. We say that um, at the beginning. Then the reliability of the appraisal system. The design of the appraisal forms, the design of the process should be such that it should give reliable results that help the management to make correct decisions. So that the scores that are coming out of the appraisal, they are credible, they can be relied for decision making. And that is why we took the effort to take you through the multiple performance appraisal system. We were able to give you the advantages and their weaknesses and how you can, some could not be relied on for decision making so that when you're picking the, the tool and the process, then you pick the correct one. Then the last three requirements is documentation. I had talked about the documentation and we said the entire performance appraisal shall be stringently documented. We so talk about stringently. This is for the organization to avoid any litigations that are related to performance. If it comes to the firing and the termination of employee or disciplinary measures at various stages, including reviews, the feedback comments need to be documented, employees comments need to be documented so that they don't come back and say, I did agree with the appraisal of what was said. Even the interventions, when you're trying to resolve those issues with employees, must be clearly documented. And I always tell HR, the way you document your work, the way you carry out your duty, ensure you do the documentation so well, knowing that any decision or any process can lead you to the corridors of court. Then accuracy of the rating. Ensure that each performance management system shall aim to gather accurate information about the performance of the employee by ensuring that individual performance is accurately rated. And that is why we, we, we actually base it on the proper documentation with documentary proof. So that a supervisor does not just sit and say, this is not a performer. Why is that statement based on? Is it just a narrative or an observation or do we have tangible evidence, because if these cases go to court, the burden of proof is on the organization, the employer. Who is the organization and the employer? When you come to giving the burden of proof, discharging the burden of proof in a court of law, HR, you have to give that evidence. It will not even come to the supervisor. It is you as the organization, as the HR, who have been sued. It's not the supervisor in their own names. So the quality of the rating form must also be very well documented 
so that it is able to capture the job requirement, responsibility, the competences, and the behavioral, and be measurable or that combined together. An important aspect of performance appraisal that has to make an effective, uh, make it effective is the quality of the rating form. The sections of the rating form should be targeted towards rating individuals at various specific areas and parameters. We introduced issues like introduce a, safe, a self ratings column so that an employee has an opportunity to rate themselves and an agreed rating. Ensure that in your form, you have that interview engagement conversation. You also have an area for developmental and the action plan after the appraisal so that it is jointly agreed and we ensure that a conversation and an employee is satisfied, is satisfied with the interview and the conversation. Maybe some of the factors, when we do all these things, we can do all that. Do we have factors that actually influence our the effectiveness, uh, the efficiency of our performance appraisal? And we say, of course, we have some factors that influence the success or failure of performance appraisals with all those things in place. Because uh, whatever we are going to be taught in class, I said, it's not a straight cut jacket. That's what I said yesterday. Because if I give you all these parameters that I've given you all these tips and how, we are going back to our organizations that are very unique and they are different. My organization is totally different from yours. And that is why the choice of the method will differ from one organization to the other. The culture, the environment that you're subjecting these things that you have learned differs. It could be, does your organization have a culture of trust? Does the HR has a say in the strategic planning and the implementation of the strategic plan and also the departmental planning, do you have a say? Does the HR lead the performance appraisal or their work is just to tick the box? Those are some of the factors. What is the size of your organization? Have you been empowered? How is the relationship between the employers eh, and the staff? Do you have a union? How do you relate? So those are some of the after, uh, factors that influence. Let's look at some. Some is that uh, the success or failure of a performance appraisal depend on some, uh, the such factors as these. The first one, the employee should be allowed to participate more in the appraisal process. So do you have an, an environment of open engagement and where the communication is two-way? This will help the employee to be more satisfied with the appraisal interview. It helps the employee to be more satisfied with the manager himself or herself, and it makes them more likely to accept and to meet the performance improvement objective and even the performance improvement plans if they were to be subjected to that. Then a manager should use positive motivational techniques to keep the employee happy, satisfied with the appraisal interview with the manager. Do your managers try to cultivate that motivational techniques and to keep the employees engaged and happy? Or your managers use negative approach that they need to be respected, they need to be feared, and their communication is only from the supervisor to the employee. What is the leadership style of the employee? And do we need to develop their capacity to be able to achieve this? Because as you can see, the success and the failure of this uh, appraisal, again, there's a lot of heavy weight on the line managers and the supervisor. What are their leadership styles? Then number three, Manager and employee should both participate in mutually setting specific performance improvement objectives. This will result in better performance than when the managers use a general discussion or just criticism. Are your managers ready to sacrifice their time, set time to come and set targets for every employee and discuss with them and say no before they start working? so that the employees or are your managers, the one who come to sign the performance agreement in the middle of the year. Then managers should focus. In fact, we had a case where, uh, we had a case where the senior managers uh, performance targets had not been signed by the CEOs for the entire organization. So you can imagine that kind of lethargy is cascaded down to the employee. If that is your environment, 
then how do you deal with that? Then managers should focus on discussing and providing solutions to problems that hamper employees' current job performance. They should be able to take their time, discuss with their employees, know their strengths, their challenges, and help them come up with solutions so that there is improved job performance. Then we're also saying both the manager and the employee should employ more thought and preparation before their appraisal interviews. Does this happen? This will lead to greater benefits of the whole appraisal system and also the interviews. And finally, we say the appraisal will be more beneficial if the employees perceive that performance appraisal results are tied to organizational rewards, such as incentives, bonuses, promotions, and they are used for positive decision making. Because you can have a team where we have very high performance, but then we don't even have solutions for poor performance. So what are some of the strategies you'll ensure that the people who are really star performers and they are, more, they are not pulled behind by the poor performance because there are no sanctions? Whether we perform or not, we are at all apart. We, we get the same salary increment and the incremental notch. So what do you think will motivate the, the star performers to actually continue performing at their high performance? So we need to come up with those reward and recognition that are, are based on their performance. So that is, those are the factors that influence the success of performance. And finally, now we can go to the last bit, which is the errors of performance appraisal. And we are going to look at them. Then we'll also look at some of the guidelines when you are looking, you're doing the appraisals and we will close our training. So um, you're going to look at some of the source of performance appraisal errors. And this is actually where you'll see the need for you to train the appraisers. It will show you what goes on when the supervisor, some, not all of them, are doing that performance appraisal with the employees and what maybe probably our employees are subjected to by the appraisers or raters, probably for lack of knowledge, because of lack of capacity building, or just the lack of know-how. And you'll see the things that we assume the supervisors, because they are superior than us, they have many years of experience that they know that we may be assuming they know, but they don't know. So some of this will include, uh, and maybe just a statement before that we say, that force rating and various such errors that we are going to, to look at may adversely affect the data collected during the appraisal. So what comes out of that data collection will actually be false ratings and they'll not be credible. And uh, if we rely on them for decision making, then they'll be subjective. And you can imagine how they'll make the employee feel knowing that maybe their supervisor wa was biased and the rating they got led to this kind of, maybe led to this kind of a, a, a decision to be exposed to them. And you can also see the, 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 the unfairness. So the first error that happens when you're doing the performance appraisal is when we have unclear standards, that we come up with performance criteria, we are setting targets that are not clear. Of course, you understand what we mean by unclear standards. They have no timeline, they are not specific, they are not uh, measurable, they are not attainable, they are overstretching, and they are vague. Those are unclear standards. So when you're basing a performance appraisal on unclear standards or standards that does not exist, then the outcome of the rating is likely to be false rating. The other error is what we call the halo effect. The halo effect, it is where our supervisors give a lot of weighting and consideration for something that is very prominent or one time if, uh, occurrence of an employee. You remember when you looked at the critical incidents, that a particular incident that happened to an employee, then that is taken into consideration in doing the rating and the appraisal of that particular employee, even in different parameters that that is not influencing. It's what we call the, 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 the halo effect, that that keeps on hunting the employee and every perception and rating, it is based on that particular incident. Then the other one is personal preferences could be positive or could be uh, negative 
probably your a supervisor is an acquaintance of this employee it's a family a relative or they are, they know one of their the one of their relatives and they bring those personal preferences to the appraisal so you're likely to be very lenient you are likely to be subjective you are not likely to be objective when you're doing the performance rating and the other one is the biases and the prejudices that comes that you are biased to add a particular person, a person coming from a particular area, a person's age. So when you look at them, you look at them from the biased perspective or lenses. The other one is the, uh, the, what we call the discrimination. That of course we know what we call equality and also the equity. That probably I'm looking at uh, an employee who is uh, maybe have some disability, an employee who is maybe going through some medical challenges and they are not able to work as um, effective as the others and they may need some special consideration. We all treat them with the same yardstick. Or we might decide because this person happened this or they have different personality, we discriminate against them. Discrimination brings a error in performance appraisal. The first impression, of course, we always say the first impressions never lie. But uh, you, you have incidences where the appraisers base all their appraisal on the first impression. Probably the employee got it wrong on the first on current, and this didn't happen. So the, the, the supervisor actually keeps on putting that first impression. This is the impression I have about product. This is the impression I have about them. And that influences the entire appraisal. And they are not able to remove themselves from the first impression to how they uh, maybe the employee is progressing, developing, improving, or they are also changing. It could be the positive first impression. It could be a negative first impression. So we know people change, people grow, people learn, and people, those are the, the changes and the growth of an employee should be taken into full consideration, not just the, the first impression, could, which could be false. Then the other error is what we call the central tendency. You remember when you were talking about the first distribution kind of ranking is that central tendency that we have to get the bell curve or a normal curve for performance appraisal. So we need, we, we, we have the urge or uh, we, uh, we, 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 we take that uh, generalization on how the performance tendency should be. The other issue is leniency and strictness and this may vary from one department to another, one rater to another, where you see some raters are very strict in their rating. Others are too lenient because they don't want to offend the employee. They know there's a bonus around the corner. I don't want to be the cause of these employees being put on PNP. I don't want to be the cause or the reason for these employees being terminated. So I just decide to be lenient and not bring out the issues. But are we helping the employee develop? Are we helping the employee to perform better? Others are just strict, naturally strict. And you can see when you're comparing maybe the performance of one department and another department, where one leader is brilliant, the other one is strict, then of course the rating that comes out of it for corporate and organization decision making, when you come to incentives, salary increments, and the bonuses and decision whether like promotion, then that is false rating and it's likely to lead to poor decision making. The recency effect. Recency effect is where uh, a supervisor bases his decision on rating an employee at a particular score on the most recent effect. If I came in late today, and this is the day I was to do the performance appraisal, that recent occurrence influences the whole discussion about today. Of course, the supervisor changes the mood, the approach, look at you differently, or previously you have performed uh, for the entire year, then early last month, something just happened and changes things. Of course, cumulatively you have performed, but this recent incident that has occurred makes the, the, the rate or the appraiser rate you differently from how you'd actually supposedly rated you if that occurrence didn't happen. Then we also have what to call the actor observer bias where an employee can decide to be the victim. See, this is how the performance appraisal operates in this organization. You take a back seat, you just observe when the supervisor do all the working or 
someone decides to take a back seat, not be proactive, not participate, they just sit and listen, the decision is already made even before, or my score is already given before you even go to the appraiser. So taking hard positions when you come to the performance appraisal and also discussion brings about the biases. You can even see, and as Pavisa is saying, I'll not even waste the time. This person has been a perennial and performer. Of course, that is a five even before I see the forms. Then the stereotyping. The stereotyping could be based on various um, areas of discrimination. It could be a woman cannot perform better than a man or a new employee cannot perform better than someone who has been here for a long time. She is too young to actually outperform her junior who is more older than them or has been in this organization. Or generally, people in this, from this region are lazy. Generally, people who are vocal are not performers. And stereotyping, people of this personality trait perform this way and they act. So you already bring the stereotypes in the performance appraisal. So that is just basically what all that means, but I'll uh, maybe go through the slides to just pick and see if there is something that I may not have mentioned. And uh, we'll start with the, uh, the central tendency. And it says the tendency of an appraiser to rate most employees' performance near the middle of the performance scale. That is the first distribution we are talking about. I think that's what we basically explained. And clear standards, we are saying that if the goals and the standard sets are not clear to the appraiser, then the appraisal may be, get affected. That's clear. The halo effect means that this occurs when an appraiser allow a single prominent characteristic of an employee to influence his or her judgment on each separate item in the performance appraisal. And it results in employee receiving approximately the same rating in every item. So one prominent characteristic or something of an employee influence the judgment of their rater and they, they, they rate them almost the same in all the parameters, whether they are strong in others and they are weak in others. Personal preferences, prejudices and biases says an appraiser's personal preferences, their prejudices and biases can also cause error in performance appraisal and managers with biases or prejudice tend to look for employees' behavior that confirm that conform to their biases. If they have a liking for this kind of people, then they're supposed to be, to rate them highly. If they have a, they don't, they, they're biased or they have a negative connotation or attitude toward a, person, a particular person, then they're likely to rate them low. Issues of discrimination, and we say employees' appearance, their social status, probably you're driving bigger cars than them, you're dressing more, more presentable than them. Maybe the rate, the race you are coming from, the sex can also influence the appraiser's objective or objectivity of the performance appraisal. Then when we come to first impression, we say appraisers may allow first impressions to influence their later judgment on an employee. And people tend to retain these impressions even when faced with contradictory evidence where improvement has been done. Then when we come to leniency and strictness, what we are saying is leniency occurs when an appraiser rating are grouped at positive end instead of being spread throughout the performance scale. This is when the appraiser is lenient in his rating and strictness on the other hand will group the ratings towards the lower end of the scale instead of being spread throughout the performance scale. Then when you look at the, the stereotyping, we are saying the appraiser may have certain stereotype mindset about certain people and may rate or judge the person based on that stereotypes. Then when you talk about the actor observer bias, we are saying that this occurs due to the fundamental attribution error. And that is the actor, the person who is acting, normally blames the environment, the HR, the form, the supervisors, and failures, and credit self to success. For them, they are blameless, but everybody else is to blame. That can be taken by the supervisor or the employee. An observer does the opposite. They play the victim and they just observe. Then when you talk about the recency effect, we say tendency of an appraiser to evaluate an employee's on work performed most recently, usually one or two months prior to the evaluation. This could also be positive 
or uh, negative. We remember the first case of Chris and, uh, Chris and Michael, where they were saying, Tom is a sweet talker. Someone may be asleep the whole year, but the last minute, because they know the prison is around the corner, they want to please their boss, they want to do this, they want to. So their last performance, which not, may, may not cumulatively show what they are expected to do, to do, actually may influence sometimes the appraisers' attitudes and the view of the appraisal. Then how can we overcome these errors? You see now these are things that happen and we need to sensitize and train our managers on how to overcome this. Of course, I'll give you a few tips on how these errors can be uh, overcome in the performance appraisal. And we are saying these are, there are several factors that can be made to overcome the error that occurs in performance appraisal. And if possible, the effort made should remove these errors. If not, uh, and we are saying, if not remove them, it should at least reduce the errors to the minimum that is acceptable and also the manageable and also sustainable. So in overcoming this, we are saying, um, the first thing is to make refinement in the design of the appraisal method and the form. And how do we make refinement? Any process reengineering calls for a comprehensive analysis of the feedback. And if we are just sitting in our corner offices in HR and not seeking the feedback, we may not know what to refine in the appraisal method and the forms we have and the processes. So that is why feedback for us is very key so that we are able to refine and also smooth out those issues. Of course, those subjectivity, when we, 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 we bring the issue of self-appraisal and the discussion, will also minimize. To improve the rating and also maybe the things that we have picked as some of the requirements, the documentation, when you bring them on board, then we can be able to minimize uh, those biases. Then to improve the rating skills of the appraiser, train, build their capacity, create sensitization to the appraisers as a team. These ones you train them separate from the general employee. Then the other one is use the force distribution method of performance appraisal to overcome errors of leniency and the central tendency error. This is where you look at the corporate performance in those moderation. Remember our conversation about moderation and say, you can actually see this was just an error of leniency. This supervisor is just so lenient and comparable to the other supervisor, then we moderate that and we look at, and we critically go to that departmental performance, look at the performance of the leader himself, and then you are able to moderate and ask for justification for such high scores. And also the issue of the strictness, you can also see because maybe the department has performed so well, but the rating of the employee, you can see it's so low compared to the other employee. So you can smooth out those kind of uh, uh, the, 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 the tendencies through the, 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 what we are calling the force distribution that is a tool used by the post moderations committee for those who've been privileged to sit in those committees. The other thing you can do is to refine appraisal instruments. We are talking about the tool. I don't think you need to seek anybody's approval when you have done all that, you have the information, you have the deep feedback, it's the people who are agitating and asking for them, for you to be proactive, amend the form, but ensure the form that is adjusted, you don't do it haphazardly. That if someone brings the feedback, you add this and you recirculate. You take stock of all that, maybe at the end of the appraisal period, ensure, introduce it to the employee, let them give them their opinion, then you can take it a whole cycle as you're doing this, then you say by the middle of that cycle, in the coming cycle, we have received your feedback, we have heard you, we have now amended, and this is the new tool. And people will be happy because they will feel like they have been listened to and their voice has been heard. And then to train the evaluators to observe behaviors more accurately and to judge them more fairly and more objective. Then just as a continuation is to help um, the appraisers communicate, uh, help improve appraisers communication skills because not all of them are good in the interview that is necessary to provide feedback to the employees. So this is where you look at individual appraisers after you do the training for all of them, 
then you come with leadership developmental needs for these people, and then you can uh, tailor for them leadership development or management development courses that will actually give them that confidence, improve their communication skills, because for them, mostly they just look at their technical skills. Even an accountant, all the trainings they are going to ask is about the technical trainings in accounting, in finance, and the soft skills they forget. So it is the responsibility of the HR to pick those deficiencies and the gap and ensure we have those management development courses, like what we have, the senior management courses at Kenya School of Government, we have the SLBP, or even in Strathmore, another institution, we have those supervisory development, management development courses, leadership development courses that they can be exposed to this. And those are the things actually they are trained to do. Then to emphasize importance of appraiser's role in total uh, appraisal process. Of course, when you're uh, training and building capacity for these appraisers, you actually emphasize their importance or the critical the role they play in the whole appraisal system. And that is why you need to train them. If you're not able to train them, look for a consultant, let them tailor, tell them the category of group you want to expose the training to so that your work will be easy. Then appraisers should be made aware of the performance appraisal method used by the company. This is both the appraisers and also. The, the, the appraisee. Of course, here we are talking because of those methods that are actually the weighting are actually put at the HR. You remember such that you just fill the form, the checklist and the other one, but now the weighting and the appraisal method and the 360, it is being done by HR. So we are saying appraiser so that you, you get the buy-in, you get their confidence, you get the support, then they should be made aware of the performance appraisals that, will be, that are going to be used, whether it is one method or you're going to subject them to multiple. So they should also have the confidence in the process. Then we say use behaviorally anchored rating scales, which are designed to reduce the halo effect, the licensee effect, and the central tendency errors. So these rating scales provide appraisers with specific examples of performance against which to evaluate. This is where we are saying the guidelines are very clear that if you have to score an A in a particular, or a five in a particular uh, performance criteria, it is guided by those narratives that you score them against. Then finally, we are going to look at some of the guidelines for performance appraisal before we close. I think there are just a few slides and we'll be able to finish uh, maybe by 11.15. Then I'll leave you some 15 minutes for Q&A as we wrap up this, uh, this uh, series for October 2022 CPD series by ACHRP. So some of the guidelines quickly that I think there are just two, three slides. I want to take you through is is this is actually just like a summary, is that the appraisal standards should be job related. That the performance criteria and the standards you put, they should be reflective of the job the employee is performing. They should not be far-fetched. Ensure the JD is there, the job role is there, what you have hired them to do, so that the performance targets and the standard are aligned to the job that they are doing. Guideline number two, the standards should be clearly communicated to employee in advance. That is the standard setting, the goal setting that communicated and jointly agreed by the employer or the supervisor or the rater or the line manager with the employee. And this should be done in advance. Ideally, it should be done before the commencement of the performance appraisal period. That when you're doing the performance appraisal for December, the end of the year, if that's the end of the year for you, you remember the processes, it goes back to setting the goals for the next performance period. So they should be communicated. In a worst case scenario, at the onset of that performance period, so that the employee have sufficient time, they are able to prepare, they're able to, to determine the developmental needs they need for them to hit the ground running and be able to achieve the targets that you are giving them. Guideline number three, 
understand that standards are responsive to actual worker behavior or effort. That the standards that we put should be able to measure the employee's behavior and the effort they are exerting on that job. Of course, we said performance appraisal measures personalities, behaviors, traits, skills, knowledge that we all compartmentalize in what you call the competency framework, and also measures the job responsibilities and the duties that we normally get in the JD. So it should be able to be responsive and reflection of the actual worker's behavior and the effort they put into it. Number four, it is important to appraise both the activities that are have been performed by an employee and the results that have been achieved. Because if you just appraise an employee on the results only and ignore the activity, the employee may have put all the effort that are necessary to achieve a particular result, but because of other external factors or factors that are beyond an employee, that result is not achieved. Then you must come to an agreement what happens. So you remember the way we are talking about even the development or formulation of HR policies, and you are breaking it into such a chain that the first step is the drafting. Let's say the HR manager has drafted, has taken them to the management, they have recommended, they have agreed, has taken it to the HR committee, he has collected the output of the, all the stakeholders, and now he has gone to ahead and tabled it in, H, in the board committee. But the board, not committee, the main board for the last approval, that's all what is remaining. And he has no control on when the board will meet and whether that paper will be put in the agenda. They might decide we have too much work. This one will look at it in January and not December. Are we going to penalize that employee 100%? Because with the results, which is an approved HR policy, does not exist, do we give that employee a zero? Or we are going to consider all the activities that went into it from one step one to four and give him probably 80% or 70% of the activity and only deny him the 30% or are we going to score a zero? That is why it is important to appraise both the activities performed and the results also achieved. That is what I was explaining. Number five, we say the acceptable and unacceptable result should be clearly identified. Of course, what is acceptable in terms of what has been achieved? I gave a, um, a hypothesis of a blue pen and a red pen. Which one is acceptable? Because we were really specific and what is unacceptable. That is in terms of the results. Also, acceptable and unacceptable work behavior should also be clearly identified that this, according to this job requirement, it is acceptable and it's known it's acceptable. If it is an, an, an acceptable result or a behavior, then that should be able to be clearly identified. So when you're looking at the quality and also what we are measuring so that we are in agreement. The, the guideline number six is the appraisal criteria should be consistently applied across all employees. We said standardization. The criteria that we measure the job should be very consistent across the board so that a particular packet or group of employees does not feel that they are subjected to more stringent criteria than the others. Be it be in a department, if you said we have a group of salespeople, the same performance criteria that is subjected to those should be the same. Of course, we know there are some parameters or variables that might differ from one salesperson to another. I'll give an example. We have a salesperson who is based in Gariza or Mandera or Masabit versus a salesperson who is, who is based in the middle of Nairobi city. So the parameter should be, or what we are calling the appraisal criteria is the number of sales that have been closed, the number of products sold, 
the criteria is the same. The result must be different. That maybe the person in Nairobi, because of the environment and the good transport system and the population, may be given a higher target, like a hundred or a thousand or a million or a billion. When someone who is in a sparse uh, northeastern, because of the challenges and the limitation, of course, we want to have our brand there, may be given half of those targets, but we want to establish our presence there. And maybe we have few clients who are maybe even the kind of clients they have, they are maybe large clients or you, 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 you factor those considerations. Another could be, maybe if you're in a financial sector, you are having two salespeople or relationship managers with sales target. One is dealing with retail. Retail are the walk-ins clients like me and you and Tom, Dick and Harry. So they can have a hundred clients, but from those hundred clients, probably each of us is just depositing 10 to 100,000 shillings. So the target, you can see it can be given the number of maybe the footprint, very high number of the people to bring or the new accounts to bring. But looking at someone who is dealing with corporate clients might even be given a target of just three corporate clients. When you are getting 100 accounts, then they ask to bring only three accounts because yours are low accounts. When you look at maybe the, 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 the deposits and the value, they are low value accounts. When you look at the someone who is in corporate, we only three in the entire year, they are maybe talking of values and the transactions of a billion. If you bring one client like EABL, you can imagine Coca-Cola, Safaricom, you can imagine the value of that client compared to me, Jane, and the other person who was coming as retail. So, but the performance criteria or the appraisal criteria is the number of clients that you have brought on this threshold. It is the same, but the results or the target might differ. That's what we mean by that. Number seven, the work performed should be consistently observed by the raters. They should not take a back seat and wait for the appraisal and then start remembering what happened. That is why at times, as we may want to condemn the critical incidences and the records the supervisor keeps, they are very critical because they are supposed to consistently observe and monitor the progress of that employee through interviews, monitoring, discussion, writing comments, and looking at the progress, they should closely monitor and consistently monitor all the employees, not particular ones. Number eight, we are saying raters should be trained in appraisal and how to share feedback results with employees. I think that is one thing that I have emphasized. And you can imagine even the way I've arranged those guidelines, it is like a continuous chain. So if one point is broken, and the chain is broken, then the whole system might just collapse because you can imagine remove that issue of the feedback and the monitoring, the whole appraisal system will collapse. It is essential, number nine, that the feedback given is developmental and is free from judgmental appraisal that we are talking about. That the feedback given should be developmental and we say it is free from personal bias and judgmental. Don't go personal. Don't have feedback and interview to judge an employee. Whenever you go sit for appraisal interview, the essence and the purpose is how do we improve the organization performance? How can I help the employee improve their performance? How can we improve our departmental performance by pulling together and we rallying everybody and ensuring everybody as they are, they, is at their best to perform? So it is not to judge or to criticize. It should be developmental focus. And number 10, we are saying there should be a protocol in place in the performance process for any kind of appeal to resolve judgmental or rating disputes or what we call performance grievances. And that brings me to the end of my guidelines. Uh, the last one is just a case study, which you'll get in your notes. And uh, it is just for you 
to jog your mind and to be practical and to this is just a homework that I'll not mark, I'll not come back. It is just for you. And just to, 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 to just see what can happen, and I see it happening when you go to recruitment, is this gentleman called Rohan uh, Bernam, allow me to just read the case, and you see how practical it is in your workplace and how practical it is. For some of you, I heard you're in a transition phase. You want to go into consultation. Some, uh, some have been in HR for two, three years. They're aspiring to grow to managers or they're aspiring to get a better job in a bigger organization and you never know where you will land. So you might be the next Rohan Verna, uh, and you might even get that question in an interview. How are you going to respond so that you are able to ensure that you are that strategic HR? And the, 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 the case study is just that if you were maybe physical, we could have discussed, we could have come to plenary sessions and we discuss, we give an answer, but this is just for food for thoughts for you. So Rohan Bernam has been recently promoted to the position of head of human resource in a leading uh, manufacturing of tires uh, industry. And he has always wanted to improve the existing performance appraisal process prevalent in the organization. The major issues that he sees within the present process is the biased appraisal and or too lenient or too strict appraisal by some of the appraisers. He also finds that the appraisers do not understand the appraisal forms and nor are they aware about the key roles that they play in the appraisal system a very common scenario in most of our current organization and organizations that we are going to meet in future and May. This is all what we see in consultancies. So my questions to you was as your homework, what measures should Rohan take in his new position to improve the overall performance appraisal process? And number two, which method of appraisal in that kind of an organization do you think would best be suited for such an organization? And finally, what should he do to involve the managers, the appraisers to get improved appraisals done? Because most of the challenges is the supervisor. And I think that is all that I had. This is just a page for the summary, what we have learned uh, from yesterday to uh, at this point. We have looked at all those methods that you can see. We have uh, looked at what is performance appraisal, I've helped you look at how you look at the strategy, the job requirements, the JD, how you, you, you tailor your performance appraisal tools. And I've also given them the errors that I've given you the errors that we, we see, what the processes and how to overcome these errors. And I've also given you some guidelines on how you can improve your current appraisal. So with that, I think uh, I have done justice to what I was supposed to to give, uh, but I can take some few comments. Uh, it's already 11.15, as I said. So um, almost 11.20 for the last 10 minutes. It's just for Q&A and maybe any questions that uh, you want to raise, any comments you want to give, then we can call it a session. And congratulations for going through this performance appraisal module, which has taken us two days to complete. And I believe apart from getting the certificates that you'll get from ACHRP this morning, and apart from using that for proof of getting your CPD, I believe and I hope that we've been able to learn from each other and we've been able to, to get uh, value for our six hours that we have been discussing this. Let me hear your, from you comments, questions, anything you want to share with us before we close the session? And uh, I'm very grateful for your concentration, for your participation. Uh, it has been a wonderful experience. So thank you. Let me hear your comments and questions before we close. Any comments? You can put them on the chat. Comments, chat. Yes, Agnes. Mm -hmm. Agnes has said yes. What is yes to? Agnes, that we have learned in the two days. Uh -huh. Anybody who can unmute? Yes, yes. Yes was meant for the following and the clear the clarity of what you had taught earlier. That was something meant mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. It's not this one. I'm just putting up what I'm okay. up for the learning process. 
uh, I'm happy to hear that you have followed, that it has been um, impactful to you. And we have learned one, two or three that we are going to take back to our workplace. Thank you, Agnes, for that. Um, Kishaga, thank you for the presentation. It was executed very, it was executed very well. Are we going to get the notes? Yes, you will get the notes. The SHHRP has a learning management system, the LNM system. And uh, I'm sure this is where you registered your course on. I can see Dan has dropped off. And uh, in that portal, once you register, if you go back, he will upload these notes and you'll be able to see all the notes. And the beauty with our learning management system is that once you are registered, you can print your certificates for proof of CPD right from that portal. And you can also access the notes. Of course, you'll be able to view the notes now uh, and you'll be able to have access to those notes even in the future. As long as you remain a member of that, uh, you'll be able to just click in all the courses that you have done. You'll be able to, for, to see the, 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 the video following and also the notes. You can also go to YouTube and you'll get this presentation because we are recording them on live. So all these are available in our learning management system. And in case you have challenges about the logging in, uh, it is ACHRP. You, you go to, to www.achrp.org. And in case you have any challenges, our contacts are there. You can always get in touch with Dan uh, through his mobile, and I'm sure he'll sort you up. Uh, and I hope you have his numbers. If you don't have his number, uh, just put, type on the chat so that you can talk to him and uh, he'll be able to to, to uh, help you have access, that is Dan. Uh, so his number is 0722-300-245. Uh, put it on the chat, you can copy and uh, you'll be able to get all that. Agnes is saying thank you for the well elaborated uh, les lesson on the performance appraisal. I really appreciate. Any other questions, concern generally? We are contented. So that's okay then. Uh, I think we've been able to manage our time very well today. And uh, with that, I'm, I'm very grateful for your concentration. I've also learned a, a, a thing or two, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in our future training. Of course, look out to what is coming up with the SCHRP. I know we have the certified HR auditor training that is coming up, and we also have the certified HR uh, manager course that is also coming. These are uh, certified HR courses that are being offered by ACHRP. And uh, one of our major sponsors is also IHRM, which normally train these certified courses and you get a certification as a course, but they're normally developed and uh, facilitated by ACHRP. So thank you very much. And I look forward. Dan, I can see Dan is locked. Dan, are you able to unmute for a minute? Just say hello and probably guide on the portal. Thank you, Dan. And uh, over to you, Dan. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rhoda. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for participating in this very interesting topic on effective performance of places. And uh, during the six hours spread over two days, we've all learned something. And for purposes of future, uh, reminders. We've recorded the two trainings and uh, you'll be able to view them. I'll share our YouTube uh, link. You'll be able to view this particular recording, this particular presentation. Now, for those who would wish to log into the portal, as uh, Molim has said, the website is achlp.org. Your login password is HR 2021. Maybe I should type that. Uh, password is uh, HR 2021. Then you can always reach me uh, through 0722 300 245. And until now, next month, when we shall be having another webinar, that is, uh, we usually have these webinars every month, at least once per month. The number you uh, get your 10 CPD points, if 
you would not want to say participate in the in these other programs for several days. So that way we cut out for everyone. Kisaga, how do I get my receipt of payment? When you go to your portal, once I've approved this particular course, there is you go to my courses. You log into your portal, go to my courses. There is a column for receipt. You'll be able to download that. Thank you, everyone. I have Thank a question. You. Yes. Hi, Dennis. Hi, hi, so, hi, hi. I Eunice here. Yeah. You. Eunice Delito. Yes, I'm traveling. You can't see me. <laughs> yeah, we've, now, we've, we've, we've my question the is, yes. <laughs> my question is, eh, what if someone yes. pays direct to their account, that's why yes. you deposit a check, how are yes. you able now to... To, to tick, you know, the way we normally pay via M Pesa, then you will put the M Pesa code instead of the M Pesa code. Eh? Yes, the check number. You put the check number. Eh? Yes. Okay. Sawa, sawa. Uh, thank you so much. The, the... Okay. Uh, Agnes Mushohi, you are well. Kate, Michael, Stella.